Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm host for today's webinar. Our guest speakers today are Andrew Legro and Nikita Mishra, who are with the Field Applications Engineering team at ABB. And before we get into their presentation, as we are in the habit of doing, we'd like to uh, have the audience participate in responding to a couple poll questions. Uh, clearly no obligation or liability, strictly to help our presenters understand uh, people as they're coming to the presentation. So if you would please respond accordingly. I apologize in advance for any typos due to my fat fingers. So obviously the first question is to get a perspective on what your present job status is and how you what your perspective on the, uh, the topic might be. We'll leave this open for another 10 seconds, give everybody a chance to participate. This is actually part two of a two-part series that we started uh, a little over a month ago, and we're aiming towards a discussion of digital switchgear, which is foreign term to, to me. Okay, so it looks like we have a quorum on the uh, participation. Here's how folks have weighed in. Excellent. And then the next question, how familiar are you with the ABB relay family? And again, this is not any precondition to uh, receiving material. It's strictly just to get to uh, understanding how much detail we need to get into the basics versus some of the more advanced concepts. So it looks like we have a quorum here. Here's how folks have res responded. Excellent. And then finally, have you heard of the term digital switchgear? And I'd be a definite no on this one. So we will have an opportunity to answer questions at the end of the session, but feel free to use the question control box on the webinar palette to enter questions even during the presentation. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Here's how folks have responded here. Excellent. Again, thank you all for uh, joining us today. And now I'd like to hand it over to Andrew Legro. Andrew, give me just a second and I'll hand you the podium. Okay, you can share your screen. Okay, excellent. Um, good afternoon, morning to everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Legro um, with ABB. I'm a field application engineer in um, Florida, the uh, USA. Um, this presentation um, is a continuation, uh, as Jim was saying, of something that we started a while back. Um, it turned out there was just way too much information uh, in the first part of it, so kind of extended it out to a, a second session. Um, I'll do a little bit of review stuff with you. Uh, but the second half of this presentation um, will be on um, uh, related topic, uh, digital switchgear, which is kind of application of uh, uh, relaying, and that'll be with um, with Nikita Mishra. She's also a, a field application engineer, um, formerly with the relay division, so she's pretty knowledgeable about uh, the product line. Um, so she'll take over um, at about the 130 mark. Um, so I will that will jump into part two of the. Um, uh, protective uh, relaying basics. Um, generally, the class was supposed to be a, uh, a, a presentation for to convey a, a really basic understanding of protective relays to uh, engineers and technical people that may not be familiar with them, um, and maybe familiar more with low voltage equipment, low voltage breakers, uh, specifically with the application and and coordination element of um, of uh, protective systems and breakers and whatnot. Um, so there are a significant amount of differences between uh, relays, which are applied at, at, at medium and high voltage versus um, low voltage uh, protective equipment. Um, they do basically the same function, but in, in a lot of ways, uh, in a completely different, different um, uh, terminology, different methodology. Um, so in part one, we kind of covered uh, what the protective relay is compared to a low voltage circuit breaker. Um, we went over some concepts and we based it on 
kind of the beginnings, which is the electromechanical relay. It's a really basic device. And we kind of built the, um, the type terminology and technology concepts uh, around that uh, electromechanical relay due to its simplicity. And then we kind of branched off into uh, the next generation of relays, which are um, electronic, numerical, multifunction devices. So that was part one. It, 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 it extended a little bit. I did a little bit of part two in the first section where the objective was to uh, show some um, application and uh, coordination examples of uh, protective relays. So part two today will be um, focusing much more on the um, uh, overcurrent pr uh, protection and settings of, uh, of relays. We're, this is just going to be focused on uh, time on overcurrent, um, no other uh, bells and whistles and protective settings. We're not going to discuss those. There's way too much information. Um, and then a little section on, you know, actually using the relays within Easy Power platform. Um, and then, as I said, we'll jump over to a um, digital switchgear overview with Nikita, um, which is a nice, that's a nice transition because the digital is sort of the cutting edge state of the art uh, uh, stuff that we have in the, the medium voltage uh, relaying and protection world. So part two, um, just a quick review um, between the protective relay, medium, volt, medium voltage, high voltage protection versus low voltage. The, the relay itself is only a piece of a larger system. Uh, whereas the low voltage breaker is a single package with everything built into it. So it's the, um, it's the brains plus the switch. Uh, it's all been pre-engineered. Um, you really only have to call out that one device, the, the low voltage breaker, and you're, it's a complete system. Relay is not like that. Um, the relay is one piece of three primary components that you need. Um, the protective relay itself, the current transformer, and then the circuit breaker. Um, they can all be from different manufacturers. They can all be, um, you know, varying sizes and functions and types, uh, technologies. The circuit breaker can be medium voltage or high voltage, um, air, vacuum, SF6, just a whole wide variety. So it, the, the point is the onus is on the engineer to specify each component correctly and make sure that they work together as a, um, as a system and then understand what the, what the dynamics of that system are, what the limitations, um, time delays, uh, all that information. So a lot more, a lot more engineering up front takes place in the um, protective relay slash medium high voltage world than it, than it does in, in, in the low voltage. Um, another weird item this is review from part one is uh, all the protective functions are named. Um, there's a standard for each uh, device type. So, um, in this presentation, we're only going to focus on overcurrent, and so we're only concerned with these three device uh, numbers. These are standardized by ANSI. Um, 50, which is a, a non-delayed instantaneous overcurrent, 51, which is time-delayed, and then the 52 device is the actual circuit breaker. So you'll see these designations come up. Um, and then just a real quick about uh, the current transformer. Um, this is just, I want to put this slide up basically to reinforce that um, uh, the most important things that the relay protection engineer is concerned with with the CT is the CT ratio and then um, the, the accuracy class of it. And here's a quick table that, I like this table because it shows essentially the standard um, ratios that are available. Uh, this is from ANSI C57, so this is, um, these should be pretty readily available. So when you go in to apply your relay and breaker, these would be the selections you would have for um, standardized for uh, for CT ratios. Um, jumping into it, uh, I wanted to break down the standard overcurrent for a relay um, consists of a couple different components, and I was wanted to show them on the um, uh, graphically on its its uh, time current curve. Uh, Hopefully a lot of you are familiar with the, the general concept of the time current curve, but in summary, it's a graph that represents um, when and under what conditions the circuit breaker or relay is going to operate, trip. 
essentially. And um, the x-axis is current, and the uh, y-axis is time. And it's all increasing from zero, zero at this point here at the, um, at the origin. So going to the right on current is increasing current. Going to up is increasing time. And then this blue line represents the line at which the relay will decide it needs to trip. So for example, if you have a um, uh, two, say it's two per unit current, um, and it's a fault or an overload, at two per unit current, the, the relay is going to remain closed until it hits this line. And this line is about 0.43 seconds. So essentially what this, what this line is telling you is that at two per unit current, the um, relay will trip at uh, around 4.3 seconds. Now, the, um, the, the curve is broken into a couple parts. The first device that we'll cover is the, um, the time over current, which is a uh, overcurrent that it's delayed and is proportional to the the trip response is sort of inversely proportional to the amount of fault current. So the higher the fault current or the higher the overload, the faster the device will trip. And it represents this piece of the curve right here. Um, and when you uh, uh, so in your 51 device, you have basically three three settings you have to um, be concerned with uh, the curve which is um, this, this, this piece here, how it's sloped. Um, and there's a couple different definitions of different kinds of slopes that you can choose from. The, um, the tap, and the tap changes the uh, curve from uh, left to right. Increasing goes to the right. So if you have a tap of one, it may be somewhere around here. Uh, tap two, somewhere around here, and so forth as it increases. And then um, finally, your time dial, which is your um, your t your time delay and how how far this curve is going to move up. So increasing the time dial moves the curve up. Increasing the tap moves it to the right. Um, and generally, you set say for example that you wanted a um, uh, protection for 200 amps worth of cable. You would set your uh, your tap pickup on this time on this 51 device to pick up at 200 amps so that this so basically this level here somewhere around here at almost infinite time would be about 200 amps uh, but then you see as it as the time gets uh, smaller and smaller that 200 becomes like two per unit 400 600 whatnot so that's that's the function of the um, the the 51 device it's a it's basically used for uh, overloads and and short circuits within high impedance like not not really not bolted faults um, high impedance short circuits. That's what it's intended to protect. Um, I put in some diff some information here about um, the difference between an electromechanical and numerical. But the take home is that the numer the electromechanical had very limited number of taps and uh, time dial adjustments, uh, but the, and the time dial was relatively imprecise. The numericals have uh, almost a continuous. Uh, step value, like for example, tap here, uh, you can set it from 0.25 to 25 in 0.05 uh, steps. Um, so you have a lot more resolution uh, with the numerical relay than you ever did with the uh, electromechanical. The next, the next big component is um, the uh, the instantaneous trip, which is an ANSI device 50. Um, the instantaneous overcurrent in its original form was just a solenoid and it picked up at a specific current value that you set and that was it no intentional time delay and that this curve uh kind of represents that this part of the line is um the minimum time it would take to operate but essentially what this is showing is that anywhere anytime you have more than five per unit current as the way this is set the uh instantaneous element's going to trip so if you had a um a thousand amp breaker uh, and you had a um, uh, say a 6,000 amp fault on it and with this relay setting the breaker would trip almost instantaneously um, it, it takes probably a half of electrical cycle for the relay to pick up and then a few more cycles for the breaker to um, pick up and clear uh, but there's no the point is that there's no intentional delay so the only thing you really have to be concerned with in terms of setting is that pickup value. 
and increasing that pickup value increases the current at which the uh, at which the relay is going to operate. Um, so it increases goes to the goes to the right. Um, again, same issue with the resolution. Much better resolution on the um, uh, numerical re uh, relay versus what you had with the mechanical. Um, and then just to add a little bit more, a little more interest to, to it. Um, there's there's in the in the in the, in the um, numerical relay world, predominantly, they added something called a um, uh, delayed instantaneous, which is sort of a, a, a counterintuitive, but it's very handy when you're coordinating relays with especially low voltage devices, because it ends up giving you a second level. So it gives you the the response of a instantaneous, which is definite time, which is means that um, if you get like for example here, if you're at uh, uh, 10 per unit current. Breaker would trip right here at uh, 0 0.4, 0.5. Um, so you have two settings. You have your delay, and then you have your uh, pickup versus the 50 without the time delay just had the pickup. So you can combine them. So you can have as a composite, you have your 51 time over current plus your 50 uh, time delay, um, and then your instantaneous, So that, which is 50. So this would be for your bolted faults time delay would be for height impedance faults or where you want the breaker to hold to hold in uh, to allow for coordination and then your 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 time delayed overload slash high impedance stuff um, so that's sort of an innovation that came out with the new parent with the uh, advanced and numerical relays um, here's a explanation of the different curve types for the 51 device the time over current um, this terminology comes out of the old electromechanical world and um, it basically, it, it's, um, it boils down to four that are going to be commonly used. Um, and they're all based on inverseness of the curve. So you have your extremely inverse, which is this red line here. Um, that will, that's a very good curve to use if you have to coordinate with a fuse um, or a low voltage circuit breaker, uh, transformers to some extent. Um, so it, it's a pretty often used, uh, this extremely inverse um, curve. So that, that might be a good one to start with in a lot of applications. And then as it becomes um, less inverse, you go very inverse moderately, um, the curves start to look like this. Here's a, a very inverse um, and then an inverse. Uh, so they begin to look more like um, uh, a definite time response versus a, a time delayed response. So the less... The less inverse the curve is, the more it's going to kind of look like a um, uh, no go or no go point. So, um, uh, you know, usually in, in practice, you're in the very inverse or extremely inverse um, region for, for most, you know, that's the, the curve type you use for most applications. Um, there's a couple others. Definite time, that's the 50 response. That's the instantaneous. And that's just um, time, pick up and time. Pick up and then it, it trips. Um, uh, with a definite time, you can usually set a delay too. Um, and then the one, you, another one you might see is a long time delay, and um, or I'm sorry, long inverse. Uh, long inverse would be used um, for uh, motor lo motor overloads. Uh, so like a device 49 would be typical of a long inverse, and it would look a lot like the standard inverse, like this blue line, except it would be pushed up in time a little bit. So it allows for uh, longer overloads, and it's um. It's uh, good for and pretty much identical to uh, motor overload curves. Um, here's kind of an important concept. The relay, that curve for the relay only represents when the relay picks up. It, it doesn't represent anything about how fast the circuit breaker can operate. So every time you apply a relay, you need to um, add an additional piece of time to um, compensate for how long it takes the breaker to operate. So the relay, the relay picks up, it tells the breaker to operate, and that breaker could be um, three cycles, it could be five cycles. Sometimes there's the delay in between that uh, from interposing relay that takes additional time, and then there's all your accuracies. So this is the most important piece as a relay engineer that you have to be cognizant of, because it doesn't show up in the curve. This, this, blue, this light blue stuff I actually drew in here based on um, math I did on a specific application. Uh, so your next device upstream, if you try to coordinate it, has to be clear of this uh, light blue area. If it's not, then uh, 
the two are going to be in a race condition and you, you're not sure which would trip so they're really they're not coordinated and here's a real quick rundown of what what this encompasses this area it's the accuracy of ct and that that's this is highly variable um then it's a circuit breaker trip and clear time typically that's for vacuum technology it's three or five, five cycle breakers so you'd add three or four five electrical cycles to the um to the time here um Interposing relay, you may have some relaying that adds a couple cycles between the relay and the um, breaker. Uh, that could be one to three. And then for electromechanical, there was an over travel where the disc would actually spin and then have to have some inertia and would uh, kind of overspin. Um, so that was a, that was assumed as six cycles for that. So if when you had your uh, if you add them all, you have to add them all together. So you got your CT, let's say it's six. Uh, Plus your uh, circuit breaker, five. Now you're at not that you're at the nine. I'm sorry, you're at eleven. Five plus six, and then your interposing relay. Let's say let's add another uh, cycle onto that. So we're at twelve cycles. So this this area here, you have to add twelve electrical cycles or point um, two seconds uh, onto that relay curve for your next device. Um, this just shows you an example of that. Uh, here is your um, feeder. Here's your main. Now you want the main and the feeder to be coordinated. So you set that main uh, delayed past the feeder breaker by this amount of time X, which is what you would have calculated in the, um, the slide prior, this piece right here. So this can range uh, from um, the fastest you probably would ever do is six cycles, which is 0.1 seconds. That's about, it's very hard to get uh, faster than that, practically. Um, more realistically, you're at, uh, say, 0.2 seconds or 12 cycles or as much as up to uh, 24 cycles with an electromechanical relay. And um, the, the takeaway is that the numerical, the, the modern relays, are, are much more precise, they're much faster, they're much more reliable. So you can bring this time that down considerably if you're using uh, numerical versus um, versus electromechanical relays. Um, here's just a real quick example showing um, the uh, this whole system put together with a relay combined with low voltage uh, breakers. So you have a transformer in between. So you got your uh, low voltage breaker, uh, transformer, fuse protection. It's pretty typical, and then maybe an upstream relay. So this kind of shows a, um, a a good coordination between uh, your low voltage breaker, fuse, upstream uh, distribution feeder relay, um, and this is, includes all the uh, the required time delays plus safety factor to allow everything to be fully fully coordinated. Um, uh, lastly, just an example on how what you need to do in Easy Power to um, utilize the relay. You, you select your relay. Um, and then you also have to include a breaker. So uh, the relay always has a um, breaker associated with it in, in Easy Power. And then um, this is an example of a multifunction numerical relay. So it's um, it's us, this is ABB, uh, REF, which is a feeder relay, um, model number 615, and it's ANSI, because we, we sell ANSI versus um, uh, IEC type relays which is the european version so they're, they're a little different uh same hardware but a different different firmware so this is the um uh this is the relay manufacturers the relay type um multifunction and the multifunction lets you put in um the different uh curve pieces like for one uh you have a um uh 5051 p that's the phase um and then you'd uh let's see so pretty much default values. Um, this this here for the one line, uh, you put in like this is going to be a fifty uh, instantaneous plus time over current. So you type fifty fifty one. And now that's what will show up on the one line in an in easy power. And this has three elements to it. It's got a phase uh, over current fifty fifty one, neutral over current fifty fifty one, and then a uh, ground instantaneous only. This I'm sorry, time delay only uh, fifty one device. So Instantaneous time delay phase, instantaneous time delay neutral, time delay on the ground. So you have three protection uh, functions modeled with this one one device. 
And then when you go to the settings tab, um, this is where you, this is the meat of it, where you put in the actual settings of each device. So you first select the function. So this one, 5051P, this, this pull down box will show the rest of them. So this is for the phase protection. You have your, um, uh, this is your um, uh, tap. Um, this one's set up for zero to five amps uh, or maximum. Um, and that, that'll vary. Uh, and then, um, then, then your, your uh, time delay uh, setting plus the curve. So curve, time delay setting, and tap. So this, this all covers your, your time over current settings. And then um, for your instantaneous, you have the um, instantaneous tap and you have a delay if you, if you want it. So this here, this 50 represents the um, time delayed 50. And then this one here represents just the uh, instantaneous standard time delay. Um, so we have a, for example, a, the instantaneous is set to nine X, nine per unit, 3,600 amps. We set the um, time delayed version to 1.8 per unit, 720. So this relay will trip at uh, a delay of uh, half a second at 720 amps. And then past that in time for lower currents, you have um, your curve, which this time dial and the tap, uh, there is a correlation between the physical time on that curve, but it's not obvious. So like a lot of times in a, um, a low voltage relay or low voltage protection, is sort of an obvious relationship. It's not, so you you kind of either have to look at the curve family, or just sort of through um, adjusting it, trial and error to to show you know where this where this is going to end up being because it's not a not an obvious relationship. So that's that's how you would set it in uh, in Easy Power. And um, I tried to keep it try to keep it to thirty minutes so that we can do our our digital uh, switchgear presentation. So that's all I had for. Um, that pretty much completes the the uh, my section of the uh, presentation. Good job, and Nikita, let me give you the screen. Okay, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Andrew. I always learn so much from you. Thanks, thanks, Nikita. Okay, so uh, in review, uh, hi everyone. By the way, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you're joining from. I'm Nikita Mishra. I'm a field application engineer for ABB distribution products, uh, and I'm located uh, for the mid. I'm catering to the Midwest region. Previously, I worked as a product specialist in the Reliant uh, uh, segment, and uh, that was digital substation products. I started my career as an electrical engineer at ESS Metron in Denver, Colorado, where I used to design low voltage and medium voltage switchgear, switchboards, and relay panels. So, just wanted to give you a quick introduction of myself uh, before I started. And um, since this has been a series of uh, two, you know, things that, is, that has been moving forward from electromechanical relays over to digital relays, just wanted to do a quick review before we move on to the next topic in uh, discussion, which is introduction to digital switchgear. So we covered uh, a medium voltage relay versus uh, a low voltage circuit breaker and the operating uh, principles and how they're important, the protection applications associated with both of them. Then we also saw ANSI device numbers uh, that are associated, associated with different protection functions, like 5051 is for overcurrent, 87 is for differential, and so on and so forth. We also saw what are the principal components in medium voltage power system protection, which is instrument transformers, relays, and circuit breakers. So instrument transformers feeding us the information of the current and voltage into the relay and the relay taking the action on the circuit breaker. So now, uh, thank you, Andrew, for giving the relay coordination examples for electromechanical and digital relays, both of uh, both. And uh, as we saw, saw the switch between um, electromechanical to digital, now let's move on to the next uh, journey, uh, which is digital switch gear. So these are the topics that I'm going to cover in today's presentation. It is going to be a very basic session in which I am going to be able to, you know, give you an overview of the digital switch gear so that you can bring it up conversationally. And I'm not going to dive deep into the concept so that because the time is limited and uh, perhaps we can do uh, another presentation where we dive deep into the codes and standards and uh, the technical know-hows of it. So why digital switch gear is uh, the first thing that we're going to cover. Then we are going to go over to what is a digital switch gear, the key components of a switch gear, 
uh, which is digital, like current and voltage sensors, protection and control relays, IEC 61850 communication protocol, and the benefits and challenges in on incorporating a digital switch gear. So why digital switch gear? I mean, why is this term coming up so often nowadays in conversation? Why is it important? So let's go back to what our customers really want. So they want something that is simple. They want something that is smart. They want something that is flexible and reliable. So that is because every year as time goes by, the complexity in the distributed networks is increasing because they're adding more sources. They're adding two-way communication. We're adding so many things because the demand is increasing and the technology is also flourishing. So as and then, uh, and you know, as and when time goes on, I think uh, you need to kind of adapt to the changing environment and be able to uh, still be reliable and maintain the continuity of a network. So uh, it should be on time. And uh, more, more, moreover, we are seeing more environmental friendly uh, requirements of late, and that is great for the future generations because it's more sustainable. It should be future proof, which means that if you want to expand it in the future you should be able to. Of course, if you're installing a switch gear today, you want it to run for the next 20, 30 years. And then if you want to modify something, it should be possible. It should be a possibility. So uh, sharing that and then being efficient, being easy. So these are the things that our customers want. These are the driving factors of why a digital switch gear would be a good move right now. So what is a digital switch gear? So by definition, uh, shared with uh, shared with us by our colleagues at ABB Switchgear, I'm just going to take a moment and read out this uh, definition. So Switchgear with device information, um, uh, device status information, current and voltage measurements, and commands are reliably transferred on a common communication bus. The common communication bus being the IEC 61850 communication protocol. It's an interoperability protocol between different vendors. So obviously in a, in a substation or in a grid, not all the devices that are running are going to be from the same vendor. But now to maintain, you know, to expert uh, reliability, we want them to talk to each other and share their status. So uh, that is something that can be enabled by a digital switch gear. Alternatively, or as a part of this, the digital, uh, I mean, the switch gear and its equipment condition monitoring and diagnostic information is also digitally available for advanced analysis. So what that means is like if we uh, monitor our conditions like uh, temperature, humidity, partial discharge, or uh, circuit breaker um, circuit breaker status, so that should be available for further analysis at a later stage. So that is also enabled by a digital switch gear. So this is something that we have sensors and uh, equipment in there which is enabling us to do all of this stuff. Okay. My system. okay. So it is the next phase in evolution of a switch gear. So what we want is more reliability, personal safety, simplicity, and uh, also we want flexibility of design, right? So now uh, IEC 61850 is the protocol standard that is used in a digital switch gear. If you want to maximize the benefits that you get from a digital switch gear, you have to use the IEC 61850 protocol. And uh, it is uh, it can work with uh, you know having voltage sensors and current sensors and protection relays which have low energy analog inputs in them so that they can read the measurements from uh, the current and voltage sensors and uh, it will be a preferred requirement I mean the preferred requirement would be that if it's a UL certified now there are different levels of digitalization that we see you don't have to adapt to it and become the top level of uh, you know, digital switch gear at one go because everybody uh, is different in owning the newness of things, right? So you can start slow, you can start simply with a base level, level zero, where you simply replace your instrument transformers in your current switch gear with your um, sensors. So the sensors that we use are like Rogowski coils for current sensors and resistive voltage divider for voltage sensors. You can also include conditioning monitoring sensors so, uh, for temperature, humidity, and circuit breaker status. So by just doing this, what you're reducing is you're reducing cost, you're reducing footprint, you're reducing space, of course, because you're reducing the footprint, you're reducing the weight, because uh, these current sensors are so much more lighter than the instrument transformers that you conventionally use. And then uh, you eliminate the hazard of uh, open CT and also uh, CT saturation. 
and uh, it's more safe for the personnel, uh, you know, the maintenance personnel and also operation personnel. The equipment condition is also monitored. So this is like a base level depending upon how comfortable the design engineer is with implementing uh, or introducing digital digitalization into their own switch group. So this would be like the base level. Now we could take it a level up if we are, if we are comfortable with this uh, and introduce IEC 61850-8-1, which includes MMS, which is manufacturer messaging uh, specification. So what that does is, if suppose you want a remote control or you want, uh, you know, SCADA, uh, if you want to enable SCADA in your system. So what you're going to do is you're going to have uh, a relay which is equipped with IEC 61850-8-1 and it's going to uh, talk with the SCADA system. And also uh, the IEC 60, uh, 61850-8-1 also has ghost messaging. So ghost messaging is basically general, a generic object-oriented substation event and the operation time is less than 10 milliseconds for, uh, for uh, distribution systems as per the standards required. And there's ethernet cabling between the protective relays. So over here, what you're doing is you're reducing the cabling between the CTs and VTs and the relays that which is robust, you know, in a conventional network. Over here, it's going to be one ethernet cable coming from the uh, current sensors and one ethernet cable coming from the voltage sensors and going into the protective relays. And uh, we, we we save money on copper. We uh, we can customize it later, depending upon the uh, application. Now, the most amazing level two is where you include process bus communication, which is eight uh, sixty one eight fifty nine uh, dash nine dash two LE. This includes sample measure values. So what it does is it takes the analog inputs from uh, current sensors and voltage sensors and it sends it to a merging unit or uh, uh, you know, protection and control relay, which has IC 61859-2LE, and uh, it reads it and uh, digitizes it to send it to the other and share it with the other relays, which have the same protocol in them. And uh, in this level, you can also use synchronization devices and Ethernet switches. You can also use uh, PTP or UL1588 devices and uh, fiber optic connection from base switch go to substation. So this is improving flexibility and giving you so much more for your application. And you just need to change things on the IED because the relays are already sharing all the information that there is because of the uh, sample measure value. So the real question is, is digital switch curl any, uh, constructed any differently from the normal one? And uh, can you make it out when you're looking at a switch curl in front of you? Uh, so when, as you can see in the picture that I showed, uh, I've shown you on my screen, you cannot make out a difference from the front of the switch curve. Where you can make out a difference is at the back. Uh, now suppose you have two breakers where uh, you have two 1200 amp breakers and you have a voltage transformer. That means that you have two sections right now. So you'll have a VT compartment because a uh, voltage transformer takes up that much space for the draw out uh, compartment and then you'll have a breaker compartment, and then you'll have another section which will be your breaker again. But now, as you can see over here, uh, if you can see the arrow on my screen, the voltage sensors go into the cable compartment at the back and can also be used as a bus support. So you see how small they are? So right now you're reducing one full section because the breaker can go here and the breaker can go here. So you're reducing the whole footprint by one section. Now, the current sensors would go in the same place as the current transformers, as you can see over here on the breaker bushings. So you have uh, the Rogowski coils here, which are connected with the Ethernet cable and uh, uh, with this CAT, CAT 5D or CAT 6. And uh, this is going to be the voltage sensor at the back in the cable compartment. They, depending upon the vendor, they can also be used uh, as bus support if they have enough insulation. So let's kind of dive deep into a little bit of um, you know the key components of a digital switch gear that are used. So let's starting with sensors because they are level zero uh, requirements for uh, a digital switch gear. Uh, so as we know, like we, we know that Rogowski coils are old, um, resistive voltage dividers, capacitive voltage dividers, all of these technologies are old. They've been there for decades. But what makes it so special is that, you know, you throw the right things in the mix together and they make a very valuable product. So now you throw in um, Rogowski coils and you throw in your uh, resistive voltage divider along with your IEC 61850 uh, enabled device. And that will be 
a great product right in front of you, maximizing all the benefits. So, uh, so that that is how it is. These technologies have been there for long, and everybody knows about it. But then throwing it into the correct application is what makes it so different. So it is using solid state components, and there's no or uh, little ferromagnetic material in the circuit. So because there is no magnetic core, Rogowski coils have air core, and uh, they basically have no CT saturation issues. And also we kind of uh, eliminate the open CT hazard. And uh, there's increased safety, reduced footprint, they're much lighter and much uh, smaller than conventional CTs and VTs. They have uh, more flexibility when it comes to the range of voltage and current that they can actually uh, read. And uh, so that, so for a uh, 7,000 amp, uh, sorry, 7,000 volts or uh, so 14,400 volts, you're going to use the same voltage sensor. And likewise for uh, 1,200 amp, uh, uh, 1200 amp or a 4000 amp uh, current sensor. You don't need to replace it. So going on to a little bit about Rogowski sensors, we know that they work on the principle of mutual inductance. And uh, the output is actually a voltage, which is proportional to the derivative of the primary uh, current. And uh, what that means is that your device should have an integrator in that so that they can integrate the secondary, uh, integrate the output into the secondary current. And uh, there is no magnetic core, so there is no saturation involved. There is no open CT hazard, and uh, this makes it much easier for usage. So we also have fiber optic current sensors, which are used mainly in the high voltage applications because they're more costly. Voltage sensors are working on the principle of resistive voltage divider. There is no pressure res resonance as it's non-inductive. Uh, capacitive voltage dividers are used for high voltage applications. Again, uh, similar uh, principle. And uh, so the accuracy of these uh, current sensors and voltage sensors would be 0.5 for metering, 0.5% for metering, and 5% uh, for protection for the current sensors, and 0.5% for metering and 3% uh, 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 for protection for the voltage sensors. Now, um, they have a very linear characteristic. Uh, I could delve deep into it maybe in an, uh, another session when we look at the uh, curves. Let's go on to the current and voltage sensor connections to the IED. As you can see how we reduce cabling uh, in a convention, from a conventional switchgear into a digital switchgear is like you have your sensors, and then they have a CAT6 or CAT5V cable, which is industrial grade, uh, which goes to the industrial grade adapter. And then that's, uh, that actually goes to your digital, uh, uh, digital test plug, if you need it to be uh, going to a test, uh, testing device. Or it can go directly to your protection relay, which should be equipped with low energy analog inputs. And uh, we're saving so much on copper, right? Like, as you can see over here, this is a colored picture of the same thing. And point-to-point uh, -point wiring is eliminated. And we will see a picture of how, how we have eliminated the cable tray requirement in the whole switchgear layout. So the second key component for digital switchgear is IC61850 uh, communication protocol. Now, basically, IC61850 communication protocol also has a few things in, uh, involved with it. So the minimum requirements are that it is IC60 or the device should be IC61850 uh, uh, compatible. It should have vertical communication, which we just saw was MMS, which talks, uh, which basically makes the relay talk to the SCADA system. And then you have the horizontal goose communication, which is a peer-to-peer -peer functionality. It is on the horizontal bus, and it will be less than uh, 10 millisecond operation time. And process bus is basically sample measure values of uh, sample measure values, which is uh, current and voltage uh, uh, analog signals which are being shared by the devices. And uh, you need IEC 61850-9-2 LE sample measure values for actual maximizing your benefits, and uh, you need low energy analog inputs. So preferred requirements would be IEC 61850 edition two, which is the latest one, and UL certification. So why are we using IEC 61850 and not any other communication protocol like uh, Modbus or TCP IP or DMP3? Because IEC 61850 is an open and global standard for power system application. It actually defines all the objects that are there in your single line diagram. 
and uh, it also enables interoperability between two different vendors or you know multiple different vendors uh, and because they all work on the same uh, substation configuration language and it's all uh, going to be uh, based on the data modeling that is done similarly with every vendor program and uh, it has again it has three different things that you can achieve with it you have goose communication you have mms and you also have sampled measure value so over here we replaced copper with ethernet and as you can see this was how it was before and this is a lot of wires right and over here it is so much more cleaner and you reduce the footprint you reduce copper you're actually reducing the total ownership cost of the system. So that was kind of an, a rundown or quick basic concept of uh, digital switch gear. Let me go into the benefits of uh, having a medium voltage digital switch gear, the five S's, which are most important, safety, savings, speed, simplicity, and sustainability. So of course, safety comes first. So we have to, uh, we have to determine that yes, this uh, this particular application kind of um, eliminates the hazard of having open CT secondary, and we have no CT saturation, so that is great. And then uh, the solution is continuously self-supervising with maximized error detection. Then we are saving so much. We are saving on space. We are saving on footprint. We are saving on inventory cost, and uh, we have energy savings because these are low power. Uh, we are saving on total cost of ownership. Speed, uh, it has to be like great speed, and that is uh, uh, that is determined. Simplicity, it's fewer wires to install, fewer maintenance requirements on this whole uh, process, so it's increased reliability. Sustainability, universal standards, IC6850 enables future system expansion, future load chains without any mechanical reconfiguration because these sensors and voltages can actually cater to a lot of range, uh, a huge range. So lower lifetime environmental impact. So benefits versus challenges of a digital medium voltage switch gear would be that we just saw the benefits. It's increasing your safety. It's in energy efficient and climate friendly. It's increased flexibility, reduced footprint, optimized weight, faster lead times, of course, because it's uh, not very common out there. And uh, faster installation and commissioning, lesser maintenance, and uh, increased system reliability. Now let's look at the challenges because nothing comes without challenges. So right now, if you want to digitalize your current existing switch gear, you must make sure that the devices you have in there are IEC 61850 compliant. If not, then uh, you know you are not going to get the you're not going to reap the best benefits out of the whole digitalization process, right? And they should also have low energy analog inputs available within the device to be able to take information from current and voltage sensors because those are specialized uh, inputs that you need with your device. Now, in, uh, in, in practice, we see that the relays are usually powered by the transformers, the instrument transformers that we use uh, themselves. But if, you know, we are talking about a switch gear and not something like a revenue meter, which is outside of a building, then I think this should not be such big of an issue because there will be a control power source in uh, within the switch gear for the relays to power up. But if not, if it is actually a revenue grade a meter which is going to be put outside, so you cannot really uh, you cannot really power that up, and you cannot use this particular uh, technology for revenue grade metering at least as of now. And uh, of course, it's application specific, so be sure to reach out to the vendor that you seek and uh, explain them the application that you want to uh, achieve because the sensors are not out there to replace the uh, current and voltage transformers completely. If you say that, yes, they will be more popular in the future, yes, they will be, but they are not going to completely replace the instrument transformers that are currently there. So based on the application, a person who is a technical resource for such applications will be able to tell you exactly what to do with uh, uh, you know, your particular uh, design. So that would be the best and the most valuable thing that you can do. So thank you for your time and listening to me on uh, the introduction to digital switch gear. This is very basic and I hope that you can uh, benefit from this session. And wow. uh, let's... That was a good job. <laughs> uh, we have several questions and mm -hmm. uh, some came in on Andrew's part of the presentation. Mm-hmm. And they, they're under the chat uh, box if you want to kind of preview them. Andrew? 
One of the questions that came up, I was curious, when you showed the coordination between a fuse, a relay, and a breaker, and uh, you showed transformer protection, the question is, how do you know or what portion of the transformer damage curves do you try to cover with each device? That's a good question. And um, I typically, um, that damage curve represents the through fault current of the transformer. In other words, like you have a bolted fault essentially on the secondary of the transformer. And um, the curve is uh, represents how much the winding of the transformer can withstand before it becomes uh, thermally damaged. So it, it's only really good for practically about 100 seconds. Uh, past 100 seconds, I don't even bother to coordinate with that anymore um, because the transformers begin to differ. The reason is, is that that energy that is in the, in the winding during that fault, during that first 100 seconds, that begins to transfer into the cooling medium of the transformer. So um, the response becomes different. It basically goes from a short circuit to an overload type condition. So I, you know, the summary is I, I cut it off at 100 seconds and I try to protect for at least the um, single and three phase uh, free, um, infrequent fault damage curve. Uh, frequent fault damage curve is a little, is a little you, you could do it, it's kind of optional, but at, at minimum do the, um, do the infrequent fault uh, single and three phase to 100 seconds. Past that, um, it's a whole different equation with, with transformers because they have a massive thermal mass to them. So you, you really, you can't protect the transformer overload, you know, from overload with just overcurrent. It, it doesn't work. You have to you have to take into account the um, the temperature of the cooling medium of the transformer, like the, like for for example a top oil temperature. So the short answer is hundred seconds. Okay, good stuff. Uh, Nikita, on your presentation, can you see the uh, chat questions I've sent you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me take a look. I'm just reading uh, questions. So yes, I see a question where in level zero of digitalization, why is the saturation eliminated? That is because the current sensors that we're using over here are Jagoski coils, and they have air core and not uh, magnetic core, and that is why the uh, saturation is eliminated. There is no CT saturation. Are there any inherent differences in response in relay breaker response times with a digital switchgear? I would say no, uh, not really. It is uh, going on a fast communication protocol that uh, the 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 relays are talking with each other, so it is very fast, and uh, there won't be any such differences in response timing. It depends on what you have uh, the application, uh, the protection application you have in place for the same. Then, uh, does a, uh, does this digital switcher help with the supply chain disruption problem? Are they more available than the standard CTPT and relays, etc.? I would say that yes, uh, like right now, it would be great to check with the vendor. Like if you uh, come to AVB and, you know, we can take this offline if you can email me your question uh, again. And uh, we can take this offline and I can actually provide you with an approximate lead time on uh, probably the current and voltage sensors that we have in the market. But uh, yes, because it's less uh, used than the conventional CTs and PTs. So it would be wise to think that yes, it could be, but it's always good to double check. Andrew, here's one for you. Regarding the curves and the separation between devices that you were referring to, is there an IEEE color book that has uh, updated recommendations that you would refer to? Is that a fair question? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Oh. <laughs> Uh, the, the 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 best I triple E publication out there probably is the um, uh, Buff Book, which is um, uh, two thirty two uh, I triple E two thirty two standard. I, th I think there's a newer version coming out with a different numbering. Uh, it's not I triple E two thirty two anymore, but I'm not familiar. However, the, the Buff Book does go through um, a lot of detailed examples like transform protection, motor protection. Um, so that's a, it's a really good starting point. Um, Beyond that, uh, the the mantra has been has always been the art and science of protective relaying. Um, so it, it's always kind of a series of compromises. So uh, past the buff book, uh, there's a lot of other uh, 
publications available that the ABB has a bunch of them where you can discuss some particular, you know, pros and cons of doing uh, protection one way or the other and settings one way or the other. Um, so you, there, we have publications for that. And then you can always reach out to um, one of, you know, my, me or my, or my team. We have our, our, our field applications units are located throughout the country. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you can contact uh, Nikita or myself and then the, we can either help you or put you, know, put you in, some, in touch with someone that's local. Uh, that's what we're, that's what we're here for. Here's another transformer related question. How do you avoid a ground fault when you're first energizing the transformer? Uh, that, that, that's, that's an awesome question. Um, and it's not just the ground fault. You, get, you have, you have an inrush on the transformer. Mm -hmm. And the inrush characteristics of the transformer are totally different than its normal, you know, normal running. Um, and that's the beauty of the, the digital relay, the, the numerical relay is that um, you can set a uh, startup curve, which will allow for a higher inrush level. And then after a three turn set time that you set, like say you want, okay, I want this group of settings to be active when we first energize, but only only lasts for um, no, five seconds. Mm -hmm. And then after five seconds, let's go into the normal setting, a different setting. So you're gonna have two different settings that are automatically selected if you use a uh, numerical relay which will allow you to get much better protection of the transformer and have and have and eliminate any kind of inrush nuisance uh, dripping. Super, Nikita. Uh, Nikita. Uh, so it seems like you need a UPS uh, as a backup power supply for the sensors. Is that standard, or is there another way to get there? Um, could you repeat the question? I don't see that. No, I made it up. <laughs> So oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, what's the question again, Jim? So, is it the standard convention for powering the uh, the backup power for loss of power on the system? You use UPS right. or some other battery operated, or is there mm -hmm. another way to do it? So, your digital switchgear would work exactly like your. Uh, your conventional switch gear. So if you have a backup, like suppose we have a control uh, a power throwover in the system, right? So usually when we have a, a throwover scheme for the, the control power, we usually have a UPS feeding the second source. So that could be implemented in a digital switch gear as well. So the whole control and protection system that we use in a digital switch gear would be similar to the one that we have conventionally. The advantage over here is that we have a communication protocol which does all the talking between relays and sharing information. So you do not have to have a lot of cabling and wiring that needs to be uh, done in that. All right, and then is anyone else, or is there another communication protocol being developed mm -hmm. aside from the IEC standard? Uh, so right now, I do not uh, think so because they're developing and uh, uh, introducing more uh, concepts on the IEC 61850 right now. And they're testing a lot of uh, things like centralized protection or uh, the next big thing is going to be the virtual protection, virtualization of protection. So uh, these are the things that are there in the pipeline in uh, the uh, industry right now for digital switch gear. So, uh, you know, at the moment, I do not know personally. I would, I would love to double check and get back to you on that. All right. We've overrun our time slot. Anything that we weren't able to get to, we'll follow up with a Q&A sheet. Thank you mm -hmm. both for a very good presentation. And thanks to the audience for attending. Have a good day. Thank thanks, you, everyone. Everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks.